My name is Vera Kokofi, and I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, high-level panel uh, session at EDD organized by Collier CP, IFC, the Practitioners Network, and UNIDO. As you're aware, this year's EDD is part of the early conversation towards securing a post-2015 agenda that delivers a decent life for all. So this afternoon, we're going to have a dialogue which will feed into the recommendations for the European Union so that, please, so you, please be assured that every idea, every thought and every experience that we share here today will have an impact. Without further ado, let me welcome Mr. Pascal Lamy, who is the former director, of the, uh, director General of the World Trade Organization to deliver the keynote address. Mr. Lamy. Well, good afternoon to uh, everybody. Thanks for uh, inviting me as a sort of a father of uh, Aid for Trade, which I uh, initiated when I started my uh, first mandate in uh, WTO in uh, 05. Uh, unfortunately, the mother of Aid for Trade is not here today. She's very busy uh, because she's become a minister in uh, Rwanda, and she's now the boss of the Rwandan Development Board. So aid for trade sometimes translates uh, rapidly uh, into the ground. Aid for trade uh, has become uh, what I call uh, a part of the Geneva Consensus, which is the title of a book about trade stories I uh, just uh, published last week. Uh, the Geneva Consensus being, let's say, uh, at a difference with the Washington Consensus. What the Washington Consensus used to say is uh, liberalized trade, open trade, and uh, God will take care of the rest. It works. What the Geneva Consensus and Aid for Trade is about is, wait a minute, it does work, it has worked, but it works better if uh, some conditions are there, and it works uh, not that well if these conditions are not there. And the whole idea of aid for trade, which is about supporting trade capacity building in uh, developing countries, uh, comes from this premise that it's fine to have, let's say, better market access, but if you don't have the capacity to leverage this market access, uh, into growth and welfare creation, uh, then uh, this notion that trade is good for development may be put uh, to doubt. So Aid for Trade was about focusing more attention on the conditions under which trade opening uh, works for development. It has reasonably well worked. The amount of uh, official uh, development assistance and uh, technical assistance which has been mobilized uh, during, let's say, uh, the last uh, eight years to support trade capacity building in developing countries has quasi doubled, uh, which certainly is an achievement, as it wasn't to the price of uh, ODA uh, diminishing in uh, other uh, areas. So that's the positive, and there has been a lot that has been done where there still is a question mark, and this was uh, pretty clear at the last uh, global review uh, which took place in uh, Geneva last July, is that uh, the implication, the involvement, the engagement of the private sector uh, is not yet what it could or should be. And that's uh, one of the questions uh, you'll have to uh, deal with uh, this afternoon. How can uh, this ODA technical assistance, let's say public institutions, whether uh, national, European, or international supported uh, funding, uh, technology transfer, how can it be better mixed uh, with uh, private investment uh, uh, and with uh, private business? Uh, the concept, as I see it, being, and again, that's the question uh, for this afternoon, how can aid for trade morph into investment for trade? Which in many ways is probably in conceptual terms 
what the next generation of aid for trade uh, would be about. So that's, in my view, uh, the sort of objective. Uh, a few uh, more uh, concrete uh, indications stemming from my experience with aid for trade, uh, having spent quite a lot of time uh, on the ground uh, looking at what worked and what uh, didn't work. And I I'm now free enough, uh, which wasn't the case as WTO DG, to uh, give my own ranking. Uh, in, let's say, the 20, 30, uh, 40 uh, operations, organizations, uh, the results of which uh, I've been uh, checking on the ground uh, during all these years, uh, the price goes uh, to trademark East Africa. I know I'm taking a bit of risk in saying this, but you have sometimes to be concrete. These people in that part of uh, Africa, which is the Eastern African community, uh, have done an incredibly good job on the ground. And those of you who are looking at uh, what works to emulate it and who are trying to understand why what doesn't work doesn't work should look at this uh, experience. Second, there's a, a big potential uh, in uh, moving uh, aid for trade into investment for trade in a small organization which is based in Geneva uh, and which is called the International Trade Center. Now, I have to disclose uh, this commercial is a commercial uh, because the head of the International Trade Center happens to be my former chief of staff. So she won this competition during the summer. She's very energetic. She's very expert, and I think there is there one of the elements of a better catalyzation between public support and uh, private support. And finally, uh, because I'm still optimistic that this uh, WTO uh, conference in Bali uh, starting uh, in a few days will deliver a multilateral deal on trade facilitation. I know if I read the press, there's a bit of a last minute uh, tension, uh, I still have the view that they will do it, which will be a formidable occasion to test the sort of public-private uh, partnership, uh, given the huge importance of easing trade, facilitating trade, notably in Africa. Uh, as you know, the African Union has embarked on a intra-African trade uh, boosting bid initiative, most of that lies with simplification, streamlining, harmonizing uh, border uh, procedures so that at the end of the day, the cost of moving goods and services through borders uh, is uh, zeroed. That's if it happens, and I think it will happen, is a very short-term prospect for moving aid for trade uh, more into the business world and the business initiative. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Pascal Lamy. Um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Lee Yong, who's the Director General of UNIDO, couldn't be with us, but he sent us a message to add to our debate. I'm honored to have this chance to address the participants at the European Development Days. The issues of uh, aid for trade and the trade for aid have been around for quite some time. But today we can see visible changes with success stories registered in many countries, particularly in Asia. It is quite obvious that aid for trade and the trade for aid complement each other. Our hope is that the new deal will allow them to merge even further. Aid for trade helps developing countries upgrade their productive capacities and deliver products that conform to international standards and the norms. World markets offer a huge potential for developing countries. At the same time, global trade patterns have changed. The new economic groups like the BRICS have emerged, and the South-South trade
has gained significant momentum. It is crucial for developing countries, especially the poorest, to harness the opportunities offered by globally integrated markets. Better and more targeted aid for trade must accompany these efforts. It is essential to invest in supply-side capacities and in the productive activities of the manufacturing sectors. Reinforcing the necessary quality infrastructure help to comply with global requirements and to gain consumers' confidence. Trade for aid can leverage investments, industrial cooperation, and job creation. SMEs from developing countries do not only need aid for trade, but also market access, so they can create wealth and the jobs and sustain the growth. Public and private partnerships where barriers increase sustainable and safe sourcing, while farmers and the SMEs benefit from the new and the profitable market opportunities through the retail industry should be encouraged. Strengthening the capacity of private sector to meet the global requirements, such as on food safety, becomes particularly relevant. Other forms of business partnerships, such as clusters, cooperatives, and the export consortia have also proven to be successful. The contribution of the private sector and the trade to development has been increasingly recognized in the last few years. As an example, the European Union's agenda for change clearly emphasizes the importance of private sector development and the trade as the key drivers to achieve inclusive and a sustainable growth. This is why an inclusive and a sustainable industrial development is a key to economic growth and a shared prosperity. Developing countries and their partners will need to fully utilize aid for trade to strengthen trade and the productive capabilities. They will also need to rely on the trade for aid through North-South, South-South, and the triangular partnerships, and through investments and the industrial cooperation for long-term, inclusive, and sustainable growth. That is the new deal we need to see in place. I'm confident that if we work together, we can make this happen. I wish you interesting deliberations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Li Yong from UNIDO. Now I'm going to introduce the people who are going to be on the panel who are going to help us to have this discussion, this really important discussion about what the uh, consensus should be for aid uh, for trade. Now, let me introduce you to Mr. Jason Klein, who is the Senior Vice President Market Transformation for the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Jürgen Ole Halstad, who's president and executive director for officer for Yara International. Come on, please, give us some more enthusiastic applause. Thank you very much. I'm not asking for much. Apollo Awo, from, uh, who's the director of agriculture and corporate affairs at the Kenya Horticulture Association. Akin Soya is the uh, Executive Secretary for Agricultural Fresh Produce Exporters Association of Nigeria. Thank you. Klaus Rudischhauser is the Deputy Director General, Director Trade General for Development and Cooperation for Europe Aid. A round of applause. There's an empty spot there. It's for Mr. Malafia from the ACP Secretariat. He's going to be joining us a little later. You know how politicians and parliamentarians talk. So he's involved in conversations like that. So he'll join us a little later. But um, 
we've had two very interesting sort of challenges for us to start our conversation. Aid for trade and trade for aid. Mr. Pascal Lamy talks about how can aid for trade move into investment for trade. We're looking at the importance of the private sector development to sustainable growth. We're talking about investing in the supply side capacity to comply with global requirements and maintaining consumer trust. Maybe I need to start with you, uh, Mr. Hallestad. From your perspective, how do you think that relationship has worked? It is um, quite clear that uh, we have seen over the last uh, 10, 15 years a considerable change. Uh, and uh, I do believe that um, everybody has now understood that uh, we uh, have to go into uh, some sort of a partnership. And uh, not everybody has understood what it is all about, but to work together because one has seen that uh, only doing aid is something which is not uh, driving hunger out and also not uh, developing business. So it is a huge development, but I think here it's, uh, we are dependent on uh, trust and we are also dependent on willingness from the different uh, participants in uh, this uh, uh, trade for aid. Maybe I need to put this to you, Mr. Clay. Um, you work with Worldwide Fund for Nature, which is sort of seen as a very worthy organization. I, I, is, you know, did you feel like uh, uh, being a traitor working with the private sector in a sort of worthy, worthy cause? So I guess the question for me is, why am I here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and it's really very simple. Um, we've come to realize that with regards to conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem services globally, if we don't get where and how we produce food right, we can turn out the light and go home. There won't be a planet as we know it by 2050. So we have to figure out how to work with companies, how to work with governments. We don't buy and sell anything. We don't make laws or regulations. How can we affect those institutions? And I think in that regard, we need to be really strategic. And so we've gone through what are the most important crops that affect the environment and that affect livelihoods. How can we make them more sustainable? Are we going to work with 7 billion consumers? Are we going to work with 1.5 billion producers? Or are we going to work with the three to 500 companies that buy and sell 70 to 80 percent of the traded commodities on the planet? And if you look just at the top 15 of those commodities that impact the environment, 100 companies touch 25% of all 15 of those commodities. So we can be much more strategic than we have been. Now, that's who we need to work with. How we need to work is, is another discussion, and maybe we can go into that in a bit. Let me bring that to you then, Apollo. What's been your experience working on the ground in, in Kenya? Uh, if you look at trade in itself, I think it's all you you'd want to address uh, supply chain in its uh, fullest, a uh, very holistic view of uh, supply chain. And my experience is that you have to uh, definitely understand the niche to which we operate in. Uh, in Kenya, for example, um, we work with uh, both large farms and uh, uh, thousands of smallhold operators who uh, looking for opportunities to uh, uh, engage with uh, niche markets in, uh, um, in, in Europe and the rest of the world. And therefore, it is important for us to uh, provide them the necessary uh, tools uh, to meet these uh, uh, emerging issues. And of course, some of it has to be in developing uh, important and useful relationships that could uh, provide the necessary engines to uh, drive uh, change for us. So we've seen um, a lot of relationship with, uh, with the farming operations. As uh, Clay talks about building biodiversity and uh, we are engaged in part of the process through uh, several standards that emanate from, from our markets in, in, in enhancing uh, systems to that effect. So being a, in, in a private environment, of course, we are not um, we are, we are not cushioned by the uh, demands of the, uh, of, of, of the global demands. We are definitely part of the environment and we have to provide 
similar platform to which uh, to, to the products that we supply at the marketplace. Thank you. Um, Akin, we were talking yesterday about um, Nigeria's big hole in feeding its people and the fact that for such a huge country uh, that had, you know, in the 1960s, a very vibrant agricultural sector, it's, it's a shame that it's not able to feed its population now. Um, for you, is the private sector the answer to, to you know, filling that gap? It's a good question. I think uh, the, the discussion we had yesterday is exactly that. And uh, the challenge that uh, we have faced in Nigeria is we've caught something called the Dutch disease. So we discovered this wonderful commodity called oil and pretty much forgot about the basics and the, the, the bread and butter uh, that provide and would provide food security for the 170 odd million people who live in this country. Um, we, uh, my own personal view is that uh, there has been a huge neglect in Nigeria of the infrastructure which really private sector can't come in and, and fill that gap immediately. So actually there is a requirement for, for government, uh, if you like, to step up and uh, put some infrastructure in place but, or create an enabling environment for the private sector to actually go and do that and to give them some sort of assurance uh, uh, in that regard. I think the other issue that, uh, that is really interesting is that for a nation like Nigeria, which is a huge consumer nation that is buying everything from everywhere because it's oil rich and has a lot of, uh, a lot of money, there is uh, some uh, overcapacity uh, in terms of the private sector. So if you look at the, the number of aircraft that come into the country, for example, both cargo and passenger, uh, we're full of goods that uh, Nigerians want uh, with their newly found wealth, uh, but, uh, you know, clearly leaving the country empty, uh, you know, there is overcapacity there in the private sector, which uh, I think, uh, you know, needs to be leveraged and, and brought into play for the benefit of the agricultural sector. Thank you very much, um, Akin. Um, maybe I need to come back to you uh, on, on this. You represent sort of uh, Grow Africa, for instance, which is... Africa for Africa business. We talk about the role of the public sector of the state in creating infrastructure, in creating legislation, in creating the enabling environment for you know, things like agriculture to flourish to be able to feed the global markets. What was that about and how, you know, what were the challenges in getting that relationship started anyway? I am here representing Grow Africa. Yeah. We are uh, one of the two uh, uh, heading uh, industries, uh, or representing for the industries which are driving it. It's uh, Grow Africa is uh, by the Africans and for Africa. Uh, the um, um, start of, of it, I must say, is something which goes back to the African Green Revolution, which Kofi Annan then started. Uh, one saw that uh, there is a need for uh, doing something together to be able then to achieve then the reduction of hunger and also then to develop uh, the business. And uh, one saw there that uh, the private companies cannot do that alone. One has to have uh, uh, the public sector involved. There's also not only between public sector and private companies, also then private companies and private companies to a very great extent in Africa, which also then you commented upon that uh, without having the uh, smallholder farmers involved in it, uh, we will not be able then to do anything. They also then have to understand that it is a business for them and they can see that uh, there, is, there are some uh, effects of participating in it. And also what uh, uh, I have seen... Uh, uh, I think the fact that President Kikwete of Tanzania has been such a driver of this has also then been a major reason for why we now are seeing that this is moving. It's about now uh, uh, 30 companies involved, nine countries, and we are talking about uh, investments of more than $3 billion in projects which uh, are real. But did you find that um, there were arguments about uh, country-specific priorities, especially yeah. if you're you know, doing a consortium type uh, organization? Absolutely, yeah. uh, there has been. Mm -hmm. And also then uh, from the aid side, we uh, 
We have been involved in discussions between uh, the US and the Europeans, and we have the G8, uh, which um, had an initiative uh, for uh, Africa uh, two years ago, where also then some of the, U the European states were not completely sure whether this was something which they should align themselves into, because it appeared to be a bit too much uh, driven by the, the, by the Americans. Mm. Uh, that it is no more African-based, I think, is something which is helping us because then people say, well, we also then are willing then to participate in it because it helps Africa. And it is by the African. It has to be driven locally. Mr. Klaus uh, Rudishauser, just from your perspective in, in, you know, at Europaid, how far do you think this relationship can go or should go? Well, thank you for the question. Um, from our perspective, I, I would say it has to go. Uh, let me just take um, uh, two or three sentences why, why we sit here. Why do we sit here? Um, I think I would subscribe to everything that Mr. Lamy has said, what Mr. Lee Young has said. Uh, but we still need to, we need to ask ourselves the question, why do we sit here? And we sit here because <clears throat> trade is not working well enough. We need aid for trade because trade is actually not working well enough. We have a situation where, uh, and I, I would like to focus a little bit on Africa. We have um, tax systems in Africa which are not at all conducive to trade. We have almost no transformative capacity in Africa. So all the economic growth that we have seen in recent years is exportation of commodities and raw materials. Just an example, which is not a very, let's say, unspectacular example. Africa produces 20% of world's leather, but only transforms 2% of world's leather. The other way around, Africa receives only 1% of global foreign direct investment. Uh, that means that um, um, there is an automatic uh, uh, um, problem with growth in Africa. So if we take this for a moment as the situation that we need to help Africa to get into a trading relationship uh, to, to make sure that its economic growth actually helps it to be able to trade more than just commodities and enables it to import goods that it needs for production, not just for consumption, as you have said. Then that means simply we sit here because we have to do something about it. And this is where we as a, a large development actor come in because it does not happen by itself. It would be great if it happened by itself. We wouldn't need aid for trade, and Mr. Hasselstadt would be able to trade and to import his goods into Africa, and, and the, the, the agriculture would boom, and everything would be fine. But it is not. So what do we have to do? We have to make sure that we focus our development assistance and our development cooperation much more than in the past on uh, helping the private sector in our partner countries to thrive, to develop, and uh, to help European companies and international companies to actually trade with Africa and to invest in Africa. This is the challenge that we have to face. And so this is why we have put this very high on our agenda. Uh, Mr. Lee Young has mentioned the agenda for change. That's where we have set this. And we're now going to roll this out. And our intention is to devote very significant efforts and very significant money on these two objectives, making the private sector grow and uh, in, uh, in facilitating uh, the, the countries to trade and to, um, to actually uh, and to invest. Um, now, we don't, have, we don't have the solutions uh, sort of just to pull out of the sleeve. This is why this event today for us is part of a major public consultation which will, um, where we will collect all the good ideas, all the good approaches, and I very much share what uh, Mr. Clay has said from the WWF. That's a very concrete example. And we will try to put this into practice, and that's why we will come out with a policy document in April next year, where we will lay out a very ambitious agenda on how to refocus development assistance on helping the private sector do what it should do, contribute to economic growth, and contribute to trade. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll need to put that to Apollo. As somebody who works with the farmers on the ground, it would be good to get from you a sense of how the situation was before 
and and after the support, the extra support that you're getting, you know, and and also the relationship with the Kenyan government or the Kenyan state, as it were, you know, does this support mean that the Kenyan government is able to uh, sort of reduce its responsibility towards the farming community in the country because it knows that there is support from organizations like the EU because it's in their interest for the farmers to be able to produce to a certain standard to a certain quantity and to, to deliver to their markets? That's an interesting question. I, <laughs> it's pretty long as well, but I will try and demystify exactly. If, trying to look at the relationship before and what it is now, I think the situation before, uh, we, we couldn't say before because I think there's been lots of development assistance since independence, so there cannot be a, a status driving to define it as before, but I think just looking at it as an ongoing process is you, the, the uh, business is very dynamic and the demands in business definitely are, they change with, uh, with, with time. And therefore, for our own experience is there is, as the market demands uh, increase, as there are certain um, requirements within the marketplace, then of course business has to adopt to uh, some of these uh, demands in a way that then it can accommodate the issues that are required. So I would say that uh, it's, it's more of an organic uh, growth uh, from, um, you could definitely see uh, things growing with time and um, probably getting to a level where it is um, maturing to a particular stage. And how you v we've viewed aid is not has been, it's not as a replacement for government service because I think there's a clear role that government plays in providing infrastructure and more or less developing human resource capabilities. However, there would be gaps that uh, exist where government support is not necessarily very strong, especially in uh, capacity building within the rural communities that uh, probably government support services, services are not very strong, um, extension services and uh, um, probably technology transfer issues and uh, and, and, and most of the advanced uh, um, requirements, especially from the marketplace. And therefore, the sort of relationship that comes in through uh, uh, technical assistance or technical uh, um, partnerships is now demystifying the uh, requirements from um, uh, European private sector, transferring that sort of technology into uh, what we'd consider as a, a Kenyan situation and then um, more or less localizing that to, to suit the uh, industry requirements in, in uh, Europe and in Americas. So I would see that has w w what's definitely happened. And as we continue to see uh, um, growth becoming, there are elements where for, um, I would consider myself being more of a so social entrepreneur and the things that probably government's supposed to do, but um, being in relationship with the private, uh, with, within the private uh, communities or within communities in the, in the rural areas, there are certain needs that definitely would arise if we conduct business there. And of course, uh, as part of corporate social responsibilities then, there are um, a, a lot of opportunity now to partner, whether with uh, development agencies or amongst ourselves or through other form of um, interaction to, to try and establish a few, uh, some of very basic infrastructure like probably schools for, for, for the communities or dispensaries that would meet then the needs of the communities. So I wouldn't definitely replace the role of government in, in, in that perspective, but I would definitely uh, work it with a partnership as we look at um, uh, agro uh, coming up and uh, WWF in that, in that kind of partnership and to us as part of it through the Colia CP chain have a, a very strong level of engagement through uh, the building and the establishment of uh, capacity for uh, on building expertise especially in agricultural technologies within the rural communities. At this stage I'd like to say a warm welcome to Mr. Obadiah my life here from the ACP Secretariat. Thank you very much for joining us and hopefully we'll get to hear from you in a moment. But uh, Jason, you wanted to uh, add something to the conversation. Yeah, I think we need to be, to be very thoughtful that the aid that we give leverages change, leverages the change that we want, rather than freezes or reinforces current systems. Uh, because development is about change. It's not about maintaining the same. And change is painful. 
change involves change. I mean, it's, it's very important. It's not about doing more of the same and expecting different results. I think that's Einstein's definition of insanity. Um, it's also not about maintaining poverty. It's not about kicking that can forward for another generation. We can't afford to do that with 850 or a million or a billion people. And it's not, it can't be incremental. It can't be about a 5% increase in price or a 5% increase in productivity. It has to be transformational. It has to fundamentally change the terms. And that's why we've got to figure out what governments do best and what the private sector does best. And through both of these, figure out how to use markets to change markets all the way down to the suppliers. That's what we're talking about here, a fundamental change in how business is done. And in Africa, that's going to be pretty profound. Do, are you ready to add to this, Mr. Mylaf? Maybe I'll ask you uh, the question that Jason has put to us. It's about looking at what the government does best and what the private sector does best. As somebody from the ACP Secretary, you talk to government ministers, you talk to um, you know, the people who make the decisions about investment in agriculture and investment in facilities. Where do you think they are in this conversation? You know, do they feel they need to abrogate that responsibility to the private sector because they're able to uh, employ more people because budgets are tight for governments? How do they fit in? Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Miss Moderator and distinguished panel members of the table on the side, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry I came late. I don't like coming late. I was at the EU Parliament uh, for a very important meeting that I couldn't uh, get out of, and it's still ongoing as I excuse myself to come here. Now, this is a very, very important question. Uh, President Obama, when he made his first ever visit to Africa, came to Ghana, the West African country of Ghana, and uh, he said a number of very interesting things. He said, uh, the time for Africa has arrived. But he also said something very memorable. He said, Africa needs strong institutions, not strong men, because for almost 40 decades of our independence, we had this misfortune uh, to be ruled by strong men uh, with weak institutions. Uh, and that has been uh, the undoing of the continent for the better part of a generation. I think today the debate is straightforward. It is not about whether it's not about either or, either government or the private sector. Both have a place. You need smart governments run by smart people with strong, vibrant uh, private sector. And how best to do this? Of course, we have to have political democratization and fair elections that bring up legitimate governments, but you also have to evolve strong macroeconomic policies and support institutions that help to galvanize the energies of the entrepreneurs of the continent of Africa. This is what is needed at this time. Some countries have achieved that reasonably well. Some countries have had real difficulty in achieving that. But on the whole, I think that the momentum is in favor of you know, progressive policies that help to boost private sector growth and development. And let me add at this juncture that international cooperation is very key. Of course, there has to be homegrown solutions. There has to be ownership. But of course, we need to work with others. We need to work with Europe. Uh, we need to work with other international development partners uh, in order for Africa to grow. Africa today has most of the world's natural resources. Some rare strategic minerals are found only in Africa. 
Of course, Africa cannot eat those raw materials. Africa cannot drink all its gas and its oil. It cannot. It has to trade. It has to exchange them. It needs to do that in the basis of fairness. And also, uh, it has to do that away from the old paradigm of raw materials. Value must be added. And, uh, and to generate jobs, to, create, to generate employment, uh, and to add wealth. On the whole, Africa should see itself as being a guardian of these natural resources for itself, for its people, and for the rest of its trading partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Rudy Sharza, you wanted to intervene? Um, yes, very, very briefly. Uh, first of all, to apologize. As you know, um, I am ordered away to another meeting, but um, uh, the person in charge of this file in my services will replace me, Philippe Loeb. Uh, then the second comment I would like to make is that we are working with the ACP Secretariat on a very ambitious program to develop private sector assistance. Um, and so we, we are not only putting out a policy paper, but we will be starting concrete activity. And my third point is that um, uh, there is one thing that we still have to do, and therefore I'm very pleased that um, CEOs of large companies are here. We need to engage with the private sector. Development, the development community, development agencies do not have a good track record of engaging concretely with the private sector. And so we will, as one of our priorities, be looking over the coming years how to engage uh, to create the necessary spaces for discussion, the necessary platform, and then hopefully on that basis, very concrete uh, approaches in countries on priority sectors such as agriculture, etc. So we have, a, we have already a very clear policy objective. And now we're out for all the good ideas uh, and the uh, engagement of all the partners on how to do it. So thank you and apologies, but I do attach a lot of importance to this panel and to the outcomes because as I said, it will feed into our consultation process. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rudi Schauser and Mr. Luke, who's going to uh, take his place. Thank you. I want to pick up on a point made by Jason earlier, which I put to Mr. Malafe about the role, what the government does best, focusing on what the government does best and what the private sector does best. Maybe I'll put that to you because you have both roles with Grow Africa, you're working with governments and with uh, your, your company, you're sort of a private enterprise. What in your experience has been, you know, a couple of points on what you found that governments do best in this relationship? Uh, the government is obviously the ones who is then putting the conditions uh, that we work under in the different countries. And I think in this context, uh, that's also what we uh, are working on for the different projects in Grow Africa, is to have uh, uh, an, uh, some sort of a predictable development of the country. Uh, industry is willing to invest uh, when you have a certain um, period that you can uh, evaluate the risk on. <clears throat> uh, and uh, that has been a challenge in Africa, that it was uh, changing governments and you didn't have an, a straight way forward. And uh, this is important, and that's also then the nine countries, they have a stronger uh, government where we believe and the involved parties then can see that this is something that we can put money into. But then you also then have to have, as you were mentioning, an uh, uh, industry in the country uh, to, to work with. Uh, and uh, I must say I'm, I'm amazed, uh, traveling now a lot oh, in Africa, and uh, I was uh, in the first uh, part of the 90s, I traveled a lot in Asia, and I see some sort of the same uh, vibrations that I found in Asia in the early 90s, no in Africa. There are so many young entrepreneurs which are willing to do something. And also then, because if we are not able then to get them uh, on board, the smallholder farmers, but also then the entrepreneurs which are setting up the small businesses, the infrastructure and everything, that is uh, something which has to be there to be able for us to invest into it. And then working with the, uh, the government, which uh, do have a predictable policy. 
Um, Mr. Sawyer, you wear two hats as well. You work with private uh, agricultural businesses, but also you advise the agricultural minister of Nigeria. So wearing those two hats, what do you tell him from your interaction with the people you work with that is the priority for growing agriculture in Nigeria? Thank you, Vera. Um, <clears throat> Yes, indeed, I do wear two hats, and uh, it's very interesting because what it means is I get to hear two sides of the, of the, of the challenge or of the story, if you like. I think wearing the, the hat for the Agricultural Fresh Growers and Exporters Association, what I see and what I hear is uh, lots of smallholder farmers who suffer from a number of different uh, obstacles. So some of them have already been mentioned by this panel, so things like multiple taxation, uh, the fact that government perhaps isn't listening uh, to, to their needs uh, or is listening or is hearing but doesn't understand how to translate that into any sort of remedy for them. So there's a, a, a gap in terms of advocacy on behalf of the small guys. Um, I think the other issues that we face are uh, organization. So it, 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 there is a cost to organizing. Okay, so if you approach a development agency and you say, you know what, there's a group over there that needs support from you, they say, fine, but our rules say that unless they're already organized, we can't help. Now, the reality is who's going to leave what they're doing to go and organize when they're already on the breadline, if you like. So I think we need to think about some of those gaps. I think there's also a a large amount, uh, or, or there are various uh, levels where there's capacity building required. Governments in Africa sometimes need to be educated about the impact of what they're doing or not doing. So it's an unacceptable situation, I think, for uh, produce, fresh produce, to take four days to move from the north of the country by truck to the south. Okay, and anything on that truck that's not sold in four hours perishes. You know, that's an unacceptable situation, and that's all about the road uh, between one point or another. It's also unacceptable, for example, for a country like Nigeria, which is the second largest uh, uh, grower of fresh, uh, fresh produce in, sub in, in the whole of Africa, the largest in sub-Saharan Africa, to be importing produce from other countries because they're just not meeting the standards and the premium payers will not pay uh, for, for, for produce that doesn't meet the standards. So we do have this huge gap, even internally and domestically, in terms of educating uh, producers, educating government, educating even development agencies about where they should be intervening. Uh, so these are some of the issues. And again, you know, let, let's, not, let's not shy away from it. There's a huge amount of corruption wherever you have the sort of levels of poverty that you see. There's corruption. You have checkpoints, for example, on the road. There's multiple taxation. You know, by the time the produce gets to the market, it's not, it, it's not there. You know, the pineapples have been shared by the checkpoint policemen along the way. That's a fact. That's a reality. How do we intervene? How do we deal with capacity building even in that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, level of the chain? So these are some of the challenges. And of course, I, I, I listened intently to Mr. Lamy's presentation about, uh, and, and you know, I pulled out you know, investment for trade. So how do we get from where we are today, aid for trade, to investment for trade? How do we make that leap? And it's really about looking at the entire value chain even of how you impact uh, this change that is so painful um, and, and begin to intervene even in, in how you deliver that so that you actually get to the point where you can replace the word aid with the word investment. I think that one of the other things that's, that's happening here is that that there's a, a, a pickup in global trade, particularly around food. If you just look at the last decade, uh, give or take, we've shifted from 6% of global calories being traded across borders to about 12 to 15%. Not the most of food, but a significant amount of food and more. The focus of most of the importing countries, however, has been on health and safety. And that's, that's very good because you want to protect your consumers. But what is assumed is that legal exports means legal production. And in fact, in m many cases, it doesn't. We've done work on, on all different kinds of commodities and find that 5 to 50% of them are not produced legally. Under whatever laws exist in that country, it's about resource rights, it's about concessions, it's about land tenure, it's about input use, it's about pesticides, uh, it's about labor, labor use, it's about indigenous and community rights, etc. That illegality has at least a 15% impact on price for companies that are trying to be legal. 
And so one of the things that governments needs to do is get a handle on legality. And I would just offer a question, because I don't know the answer to this, but what percentage of social and environmental problems are caused by illegality? I would say it's probably quite high. Maybe 25, maybe 50 percent. I mean, if you really want to start addressing basic development issues, this may be the window. This and waste, which is, I mean, waste is waste. If we could el eliminate illegality and waste, that would be a, two, two horses to ride into this, I think. Well, that's a very tough question you've put to, <laughs> out there. If anybody's a competent, feels competent to answer that, please raise your hand and let me know. We'll get you in. But um, this is a point where I'm going to try and invite uh, people in the room to either make comments or ask questions themselves. So just put your hand up if you've got a comment or a uh, question to ask and then I'll get to them to come to you. But let me start with a gentleman in the front. Uh, let's wait for, I'll do this myself. Please introduce yourself first. Thank you. My name is Ivan Volesh. I'm a member of the European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, uh, our committee as a consultative body uh, is uh, uh, elaborating uh, opinions on international trade from the point of view of the civil society, which we represent, uh, we have uh, issued already several opinions. Uh, we have endorsed the ideas of uh, fair trade. We support uh, the aid for trade. Uh, my question is linked to the uh, situation uh, in the international trade uh, arena. We are approaching uh, uh, Bali uh, conference, uh, uh, where we hope we will be. We will see the breakthrough in the. Uh, WTO negotiations on multilateral uh, agreement. Um, uh, do you think that it will have a positive impact also on the idea of uh, aid for trade, trade for aid, since it uh, multilateral agreement includes also uh, the uh, uh, aid for trade uh, for the developing countries? And the second question is uh, linked uh, to the role of the civil society, uh, including uh, business, trade unions, NGOs, in monitoring the uh, implementation of uh, several existing uh, free trade agreements. Uh, we have uh, ACP. Uh, if, if uh, the role of uh, civil society should be enhanced uh, to really monitor that uh, uh, the, the uh, mutual trade is really in the interest of uh, both sides. Who wants to take the questions? Do you want to pick up on the uh, first one? Yeah. Well, well uh, I think that on trade agreements, um, I mean, the... the, the the difficulty is that you are, uh, est when you are establishing a trading agreement between partners that are at different level of development in their industry, in their capacity to trade. Uh, so this is uh, the situation that we are uh, facing uh, with uh, most of Africa, for example. Uh, it's much easier to et establish a free trade area with a partner like Mexico, uh, which has uh, uh, something to offer and something to gain out of the deal. Uh, the difficulty with, with Africa is to identify these areas where there is a win-win possible, possibility. Uh, I think that uh, I don't want to enter into the detailed discussion on the economic partnership agreement, but we see that there are difficulties in making sure that both parties see a common interest in getting into those deals. And what we are trying to do with our uh, aid for trade is to make this process easier to uh, identify opportunity uh, for uh, African uh, countries to uh, um, get their share of the uh, globalized economy uh, where they can enter into value chains. But this is a process which is slow and which needs uh, a decent business environment, uh, which is again a process which is difficult, it's hectic because sometimes you make gains and you can re reverse these gains very quickly. So uh, this is the whole uh, challenge of uh, working in um, developing countries and not to talk about fragile countries where government uh, capacity is almost inexistent. So we are uh, dealing with, uh, in developing countries, with a wide variety of, of, um, of uh, countries and situation or difficulty as a, as a public donor is to try and adapt and find the right response for each of the situation. 
But basically, I would say there were comments on the on the, uh, uh, the, the, the Washington consensus and the Geneva consensus. It's true that uh, in theory, I mean, by fixing the business environment, you let the market play and you will have investment coming and you will have uh, uh, a growing middle class and uh, everything is done. We, we know by experience that it's not that as easy as that. And that's where we are trying to find new innovative ways of uh, um, making sure that this uh, economic growth, private sector-led economic growth, can be accelerated through a better partnership with private sector. Do you want to pick up the question on civil society? I mean, yes, we want private sector to lead this accelerated growth, but what are the pitfalls? Well, I think, I think we, we have to, as they say, trust but verify. Uh, eyes wide open when we go into these kinds of partnerships. We need to see what the commitments are, and they need to be public. Uh, we need to set targets that are measurable and to show what those targets are and to report against them each year what the progress has been. And if it's less than expected, explain why. That's kind of all the public side of this. I think at another level, the thing we have to be really, the speed of change on the planet today is faster than it's ever been. Economic growth is going faster than people have, have ever seen it. How can we learn faster? How can we share information more quickly? Sustainability, we're finding with all the companies we work with, and we're engaged with about 58 or 60 of the 100 largest food companies on the planet, they're sharing information with each other about sustainability because it's a pre-competitive issue. Whether there are raw materials or not, everybody depends on how you market them, how you sell them, what portions, how you package them, all that stuff, that's competitive. Whether they exist or not, the raw materials to even buy is pre-competitive. And every company buys from the same producers on any given day, any given week, any given month. So they all depend on raising all boats. Because it's not really just about the supply today of raw materials, it's about the supply in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, with increased population, increased income, and increased consumption. So this is the backdrop, I think. We've really got to start focusing and measuring a few things, not everything, as proxies for the sustainable development. And we have to have agreement about that. We have to build awareness about the issue and then consensus about how to move forward. I'll come to you in a moment, Mr. Hazelstadt, but to Mr. Malafia. Well, um I'm in agreement with all that has been said, but I just wanted to throw in a suggestion. My dear colleague on the left here mentioned um, you know, uh, the various consensus that have been made on, on some of these issues. And, uh, and I was just thinking, uh, is this not a good time to think of a new consensus? In the 80s, we have the Washington Consensus. And the Washington Consensus was that the market knows everything. And all of us are idiots. We don't know anything. It's the market that does. Uh, we saw the results. We saw the consequences. Uh, in the Great Recession uh, that the whole world has undergone, of course, it was very important to get the markets right and to get the price mechanism right. I think that was fundamental. But we ended up throwing away the baby with, with the bathwater, as it were. In Africa, currently people have been talking about the Beijing consensus. And essentially the Beijing consensus is that, well, don't ask questions about uh, human rights, just go in there, sign the deals, do the business, and leave some things behind, like infrastructures, bridges, roads, but otherwise, no questions asked, with very little transparency in the whole thing. Now, it's achieved a lot, like the Washington Consensus before it, but it left many unanswered questions, and some element of disenchantment. I think time has arrived for a new generation consensus. And I call it Washington plus Beijing plus 
uh, Brussels. The fourth summit will take place in April this coming year, right here in this charming city of Brussels. And uh, Africa and Europe have come a long way. Today we are doing more business with China, the biggest investor. Uh, but I think Africa is big enough for everyone. I think everyone can uh, have a piece of the action. Uh, but we need a new framework that gets markets right, that gets the institutions right, and, the, and that gets the international financial and economic architecture right. That is the ownership of the development process, transparent investment agreements, robust institutions, free markets within a rules-governed system of, of enterprise free societies. So we need to get all those right, and I'll conclude right now. But going forward, we need also a few more things in terms of the reforms that will help, you know, all these things we've been talking about to actually be optimized. First of all, up to the time I'm speaking now, in most of Africa, we don't have antitrust legislation. So you can go there, make huge amounts of money in a short time, you can corner various markets, uh, people fix prices, and there are all sorts of things that uh, are not, in fact, allowed in the best free market societies. Right from the 19th century, the US set up the antitrust legislation. And to me, having a free market economy without clear and effective rules is like playing uh, Hamlet without the Duke. It won't work. Number two, land reforms. That is still an area where we still to get it right. Uh, the various land tenure systems in Africa still pose huge challenges. Most land is community owned. Some of the richest and fertile lands are to be found in Africa. But we need clear legislation so that this land can uh, go into the, the market economy and can be bought and sold. And that links to property rights. We need to be stronger and clearer with respect to property rights. And of course, linked to that sanctity of contracts and uh, commercial law systems need huge reforms. The Francophone countries have gone a step higher trying to unify their commercial law systems, but in the English speaking and other countries, we are yet to do that. Uh, investors want coming, even with the best of terms, if they, they realize that if they have a problem, uh, the legal process could take forever. That's not good enough, whether it is domestic or foreign investors. And of course, the financial infrastructure and the institutional infrastructure has to be right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Just a small comment on that. Uh, you're absolutely right. Property rights is very important, and in particular for women in particular in the uh, agricultural uh, business because that's uh, mainly done by uh, the, the women. And uh, to be able then to get financing, you have to also have property right. But I think uh, just a small comment on uh, the uh, uh, trade agreement. And uh, as I said, the, uh, the businesses as such would like to have uh, known rules and, and, uh, and agreements as such. So uh, we hope that there will be uh, agreeing, uh, agreement in Bali, but uh, the important is that it is being implemented because the implementation of it, it doesn't help if they just agree on things if it's not implemented because then they're just uh, words. Thank you very much. Questions from the floor? <coughs> yes, do you want to, let me do in front, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Thiago Munitz. I come from Brazil and I work for two organizations, Brazil Junior, the Brazilian Confederation of Junior Enterprise, and for Jade, the European Confederation of Junior Enterprise. And I would like to ask Mr. Akin Sawyer, uh, from our individual perspective, what has been an example of a successful trade-related reform that is implemented in the past years in Nigeria? And can you please tell me 
what practical adventures was brought to local businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, take a couple of them so that uh, we can go for I am Begoña Iñarra from Africa, Europe, Faith and Justice Network. You have talked about the, uh, the, the trade, uh, aid for trade and how it uh, helps uh, the, the trade of the enterprises. Yet, for instance, in Cameroon, most of the aid for trade that the European Union has given to Cameroon has gone to an enterprise of banana that is a transnational company. So how can it help an it's a transnational company that has is been at this moment to increase the production, is taking the land of the people, of the farmers, so they are losing their means of living and on top of that there is is just to plant bananas so the biodiversity is being lo lost as well. How in which way does it help trade in Cameroon? It doesn't help the small farmers, it doesn't help the small producers, it doesn't help the enterprises, the local enterprises. Thank you very much. And the lady in the back. Thank you very much. Um, I work with World Vision. We're very interested in this debate on aid for trade and trade for aid. And um, I'd just like to refer to the Geneva consensus and the Washington consensus, which were mentioned earlier. I think if we agree that this Geneva consensus is around aid for trade and trade for aid, I think we need to remember that with the Washington consensus, there were certain assumptions underlying the consensus that were never really uh, challenged or thought through. And as a result, I think we are living with the consequences of that. So I think the key to making sure that the Geneva consensus is successful and effective is to make sure that there are no hidden assumptions, flawed assumptions underpinning it that we're not fully interrogating now. And I'd like to suggest that perhaps one of those flawed assumptions is this whole uh, reliance on economic growth as the driver, uh, as the goal to which we're all addressing and, and uh, committing ourselves. Because to date, economic growth and the use of fossil fuel energy is there is a very strong correlation between the two. So in other words, if our aim is, and we are you know, committing ourselves to promoting very high or as high as levels as possible of economic growth, we are also going to accelerate the process of climate change, which is caused as a direct result of the release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere caused by the burning of fossil fuels. So we need to really look at the issue of decoupling economic growth from the use of fossil fuels. And I suppose the question is to what extent is this new model, aid for trade and trade for aid, really looking at that issue? If we're promoting economic growth without thinking about the fact that we are actually going to accelerate the process of climate change that will result in the kind of devastation to communities, particularly in the developing world, that no amount of trade is going to be able to address or help them to recover from then we do need really to, to, to address that question now. And I suppose the question I would like to ask now is what can this new model, the aid for trade and trade for aid, do to address this overarching uh, challenge of climate change and, and, and tackling climate change, which we as a global community now face? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Akin, you want to take your question and then maybe uh, Philip Loeb could take that question about um, Cameroon, if possible? Great, thank you. Um, gentleman from Brazil, I'm just going to answer, address your, your question now. Thank you very much. I think it's a very good question um, because actually uh, all of the discussions we're having here today uh, need to boil down to concrete uh, achievements in terms of making progress and asking about where there's been a success or where there's been a success story is, is I think one of the things that motivates us to move in the direction we need to. Okay, the example that I'm going to give you comes not from agriculture, but it does have an impact. It comes from telecoms. <clears throat> so uh, the Nigerian uh, situation as far as telecoms is concerned pre sort of 11 years ago was that there was a government company that uh, uh, was completely in charge and in control of uh, access to telephony. Um, uh, the, this is a company that uh, effectively over time um, uh, wasn't invested in, and fewer and fewer people had access to, to telephones. I think uh, 11 years ago, it was something like 90,000 Nigerians had access to telephones. Uh, then uh, GSM technology uh, came along, and the, the government at the time decided that they were going to auction licenses. And actually, they were going to leave that sector 
uh, entirely open to, the, to, to, to private uh, investors. And uh, three uh, licenses were auctioned, and they, I think they, they sold the licenses to telecoms companies for about $275 million each, and effectively left them to it. So the companies paid for the licenses, got the bandwidth, had to go out and build the infrastructure in terms of cell sites and base stations, and uh, then begin to the process of selling airtime and uh, somehow uh, uh, trying to recoup their, their investments. Very interesting. There are some very successful Western international telecoms companies that decided that, you know what, most Nigerians would not be able to afford to buy telephones, you know, the gadget and pay for the running costs, uh, and didn't invest. And there were others who were more innovative and more uh, entrepreneurial, should I say, who came along and said, okay, uh, we think there's an opportunity here. 160, 170 million people uh, need to talk to one another. They've got no real means of doing that currently. So we're going to invest, and they did. And what happened was that every village shared a telephone, okay, uh, at the beginning. And therefore, it was one handset. There was somebody there who, you know, you would come and make your call for 10 cents and, and everybody else. And actually, the revenues were huge. I mean, the, the, you know, it was a virtual monopoly for them. But it meant that the, com the country got some infrastructure. And people who otherwise would not have had access to telephones suddenly were able to make, uh, make calls and communicate with other people. You know, I've just caught this fish. You know, uh, I'm still on the water. I'm coming ashore, how much do you want to pay for it? So it starts to have a multiply e effect and impact. And of course, you've also got the little uh, uh, retailers of airtime who again become gainfully employed because they're able to sell continuously airtime to those who, who, who need it. And over time, the cost of, uh, of, of airtime has come down. The cost of uh, uh, gadgets uh, have co has come down. So, you know, many, many Blackberries in Nigeria today. Um, so lots and lots of people now have access to this technology, which is uh, leapfrog technology as far as, as far as Nigeria is concerned. Now, projecting forward into agriculture, the Minister for Agriculture today, or when he came into office, found that actually the uh, whole process around the distribution of fertilizer, which is subsidized in Nigeria, was fraught with fraud and corruption and decided that actually we're going to cut out the guys who come and claim that they're going to, uh, you know, distribute the fertilizer. They get given it at subsidized costs, and then they, they sort of pocket uh, or sell it across the border to, to, to those who, who want it. So he came in and said, we're going to change the system. We're going to cut out the middleman, and we're going to go direct to the farmers. So what did he do? He set up a scheme where they began to log and capture data of every farmer in the country and their telephone numbers, their mobile phones, to be able to send them uh, vouchers for them to be able to buy or purchase inputs for, their, for their, 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 their farming activities. And I think this happened already successfully in Kenya before that. So, you know, there's hopefully an example of, you know, where markets has been liberalized. Everybody seems to be making or winning, particularly the guys at the bottom of the pyramid, whether it's those selling airtime or those growing food and, and, and produce uh, to actually uh, uh, benefit. So there, there, there's an example. Now, there's a, there's a regulator in place who's regulating all of this activity. So going back to you know, you know, the consensus view uh, on, a, on a sort of mi micro scale, you know, there is a regulator that makes sure or tries to make sure that everybody's playing fairly. And this is cross applicable to, to, to everything that, that we do. Clearly, uh, 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 evidence there that you know you need to look at the numbers. You need to look at um, how you uh, take advantage of leapfrog technology into these uh, these African markets. You need to look at how it begins to impact the activities and the the, the, the sustainability of of, of what uh, the, the the traders, if you like, or the farmers are doing, and 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 to you know get the right people into governance or into government who can see the opportunity. And, and devolve, if you like, the, the opportunity into the hands of the ordinary guys who, who are trying to make a, uh, make a living. So that, that's really the example, and it does cross over, and I think it's about getting government out and letting private sector come in, creating an enabling environment and a framework. One other thing I will say before I conclude, um, 
when I f f first had an initial meeting with the Minister of Agriculture, he said, look, as far as I'm concerned, agriculture is not a project. It's not a development activity. It's a business, okay? And there are lots and lots of people across the world making a lot of, of money and a lot of profit from agriculture. So I am not prepared to invest in or put money into something that the day I leave office suddenly comes, it suddenly comes to an end. It doesn't happen. You know, that sustainability has got to be there. It's a business. So everything that he does, and I believe government should do, should be about enabling, empowering, and creating a, an environment in which the private sector, large and small, can come and play. Okay, you know how time flies when you're having fun. So I've just noticed that we're running out of time. So I want us to keep the pace. I'm going to be very, very rude and hurry people on. Uh, Philip, did you want to take the question about uh, Cameroon? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, I can make a few comments on this um, specific arrangement that was made for the banana uh, uh, from uh, originating from ACP countries. I mean, this was a special agreement because uh, uh, the uh, preferential treatment that was awarded to banana coming from ACP had to come to an end and the deal that was agreed was that there would be uh, support from the EU to the banana producers of the ACP countries in order to uh, uh, improve their competitiveness so that they could compete with banana from Central America, for example. Uh, and in the case of Cameroon, I'm not very familiar with the game of Cameroon, but certainly it translated into support for improving the competitiveness of the local production. I think it's not, from my perspective, it's not the best type of aid for trade support because it's basically uh, working on the basis of the pattern of the past and it's not what we would like to replicate. But these are the kind of transitional arrangements that are negotiated and I was not part in the negotiation. Maybe my neighbor knows more about that, but it was a very difficult situation because there were legitimate claims from both sides. Thank you very much. Do you want to pick up? Yeah, yeah. Just I wanted to say that I think we need to, to realize in our discussion that trade is a means, not an end. Uh, and so volumes of trade aren't really a valuable metric in this discussion if you're talking about development. And we need to understand what it is that we want to emphasize and then insist on it, whether it's jobs, income, productivity, nutrition, food security. There are lots of results that we could have. Focusing just on trade volumes is not it. We need to optimize several variables, I think, rather than trying to maximize just one. And this is a way to think about how we, we approach this topic. Thank you very much. Uh, last, take a last couple of questions, very quick ones. Uh, thanks, Oliver Griffith, International Finance Corporation, World Bank Group. We're happy to be a partner of this. Unfortunately, the speaker we had foreseen couldn't make it. So let me just make two very quick practical points. Infrastructure, everybody's really pointed out how important it is. Without infrastructure, there is no trade. Without uh, electricity, you can't produce goods. Without roads, you can't get to the market, the ports, etc. So you need PPPs, and this is where the private sector comes in. Governments don't have the money anymore, uh, enough money, especially during the crisis, to do PPPs on their own. So the private sector has to come in. Governments have to make the right framework for that. They can't just pawn off the most difficult PPPs on the private sector and take the good ones themselves. The other aspect that hasn't been mentioned at all is trade finance and how trade finance can play a role. We started a program in 2008 during the financial crisis. It's supposed to be temporary. It's still going on. It's now almost 40% of a $25 billion investment a year. So that's about $10 billion in trade finance, uh, which is necessary, carrying the cost of trade, uh, trade guarantees and letters of credit, this kind of thing. And the other export credit agencies are doing the same thing, the bilateral ones. The good thing on that is that we can enforce our performance standards for, the, for this kind of trade finance and use equator uh, banks, banks that for, follow the equator principle, so they can have a very positive impact. But without trade finance, and without infrastructure, forget about trade. The institutional setting is extremely important, and that's what everybody's been talking about. But you also need the very practical aspects. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, lady in the back. I haven't had enough ladies in here, so. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Daisy Kambalami. I'm from the African Institute of Corporate Citizenship. I wanted to talk about PPPs, and the assumption is normally they should happen on their own. One of the things that we've seen is that it doesn't happen, even though there are precise or there are obvious advantages for both. Normally, private sector and government are not going to trust each other on their own. Um, and I think one of the other issues that was discussed here is to look at um, creating space for civil society. I work for an NGO, and one of the roles that we play in Malawi is 
to work as an independent facilitator. And it's only been made possible because of the partnership between Yara and the Norwegian government. So they provided us with the financing to have personnel that are going to look at the advantages for both and be able to translate that message so that government understands why they would want to engage with the private sector, but you're also looking at what are the objectives from the private sector side to want to invest into this process, and that helps to facilitate that dialogue. But it's only possible because you have leaders that are looking beyond the immediate gains. And as a result, you also don't have that kind of project financing where you have easy tick boxes and say, okay, we've had so many meetings and these targets because you're really trying to change people's mindset and that is not so easy to measure. So you really need to look at, have leaders that are willing to look at developing development in a different, in a different way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. A round of applause to everybody for your really insightful comments. Thank you very much. So I'd like us to, um, before we wrap this up, just look at what we've been able to achieve with our conversation. So some slides are going to go up. Ready? There we go. Sorry about that, technical gremlins. Mm. But this is just a way of capturing what we've discussed here. And I think one of the key things uh, that's come through that is what you talk about, a new consensus that takes into consideration a lot of the concerns that have been expressed here. So we're talking about uh, everybody agreeing that development of the private sector is a key driver for change, but so far we don't have the mechanisms to drive it forward. Market access does not always translate into increased growth and wealth creation, and mechanisms to leverage and attract investments must be in place there's a lack of infrastructure and institutional framework. Capacity building is lacking at all levels throughout supply chains. If we don't start thinking about development and sustainability, then we can't turn out the lights, that's from you. Organization has a cost. Traditionally, we private public donors have not been good at working together because it is hard work. So what needs to be done? Move on from aid for trade to investment for trade. Help Africa become an attractive investment partner through, uh, for example, antitrust legislation, land reforms, property rights, commercial law systems, and financial uh, infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Malafia, for those. Need to work on basic principles for partnerships based on good governance, trust, transparency between all stakeholders across supply chains. And that's what one of the things a lady from Malawi talked about. Focus on helping each player, public and private, do what they do best. Another gem from uh, Jason there. Uh, from the European Commission, more engagement with the private sector is needed. Remember that African countries are in growth and they also have consumers. Local and regional markets are a major opportunity and should be a key target add value locally and regionally and have an impact on wealth creation. And finally, and not least, technology can help us deal with some of, if, of some of the difficult issues, including corruption and unfair trading practices. I'd like to say a big thank you, round of applause for some of these really insightful views and conclusions that we've been able to draw through. Thank you very much. So as I said at the beginning, these thoughts and, uh, and ideas are not going to sit on, on this platform. They're going to go forward and hopefully will have more concrete effect to allow us to transition, as Mr. Pascal Lamy said for us at the beginning, from aid for trade to uh, investment for, for trade. I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody who's been on the panel, our key speaker, Mr. Pascal Lamy, Jason Clay from WWF, Mr. Jürgen Halsestad from uh, Yara International, Apollo war from Kenya Horticultural Exporters Limited, Akin Soya from Afgen, uh, Mr. Obadai Malafia from the ACP, and Mr. Philip Loop of the Directory General for Development and Cooperation at Europe Aid. I've been Vera Kokofi, and thank you very much uh, for your for your for your time here and uh, we'd like you to stay for a very brief but very important engagement at the end of this session.
All right, so what we have at, the, at this stage is um, a very important uh, event. There's going to be uh, an agreement, which is a positive development from this EDD days, uh, uh, PPP for PPP, which is uh, private-public partnerships for the planet, for the people, and for profit. So we're going to ask my very kind panelists to head back to their front row seats while we get the signing agreement going. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, sorry to, uh, to have this, this little uh, interlude here. So um, as Vera just, um, just in introduced, um, we, are, we are now very pleased to introduce a very clear uh, outcome of these uh, European Development Days this year. And um, I'm, I'm happy to present an initiative from the private sector organizations that's going into this, the direction of the discussions we had today. And um, um, it's, uh, as Vera just said, the Brussels, it's called the Brussels Declaration of the European Development Days. Um, about 200 private sector organizations signed a um, declaration to, um, to commit to talk with the, the private sec to talk with the European Commission, sorry, and um, we will be presenting exactly what the commitment is. They are really w wanting to to engage into a clear dialogue um, with the European Commission, all the donors, uh, partner countries, and NGOs. So um, I'd like to mention a few names of these organisations that have been um, involved in this declaration. And, um, and want to welcome them on stage to ask a few questions and also invite the uh, European Commission to see what they want to do uh, with the private sector, what's the next steps, as uh, somebody here just called for a consensus on, um, on the next consensus, Washington plus Beijing plus hopefully Brussels in April. So um, the, the, just a few points on these declarations. Um, notably, the private sector organization is willing to work towards an inclusive and sustainable growth in order to er eradicate poverty. Um, they basically engage the agenda for change that was released in 2011, but also the 2013 communication, A Decent Life for All. So um, I'd like to welcome um, back on stage Mr. Um, Haslestadt from who is notably the CEO of Yara International and uh, founding member of Grow Africa. So that's, <laughs> welcome back, Mr. Also um, I'd like to welcome um, Mr. Jetro Green from CAFAN. So just to mention, it's not only the, uh, not only the global corporations uh, who have signed this. So just a few names, so you have it. CAFAN is, um, is a federation of, um, of small farmers. So overall, this declaration is a strong sign as it represents over 20 millions of small farmers from the ACP countries and three organizations, including CAFAN. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Mr. Green. And um, the organization that was at the initiative of this signed declaration is Cole ACP, uh, who has been also working on this uh, on this uh, panel with, uh, with you. So please welcome uh, Guy Stanglambert back as well. And uh, thank you for, for making this, this happen. And um, KHE, Mr. Apollo Ower as well. Thank you for being part of this initiative. Um, Mr. Hans Willem 
from Agrofair as well, who has been part of this declaration. <laughs> Not to mention um, organizations like Orange, the Bureau Veritas Group, Quality Institute. So welcome, please, Luis Villardel from Bureau Veritas Group, who is also engaged in the agribusiness sector. And um, it's not only, not only um, I mean, the traditional agri-food people, but also um, all the organizations that are working around private sector um, in agribusiness. So the Bureau of Veritas Group has also an involvement there. But also an organization like Orange. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Fabrice André. Uh, Fabrice André, let's say it with the French accent if it's around. <laughs> so I got used to, to that. And, uh, and finally, uh, we'd like to welcome um, uh, Mr. Irshal Razali, if he's in the room, from the, from the European Commission. Huh? He's still, to, still on his way. Uh, just to have a few, few words with uh, this gentleman here about this, this declaration. It really goes into the way of, uh, of having a, a clear dialogue with the, the European Commission work into, uh, um, um, let's say, the right direction. And there are three points that we need to, uh, to, clear, to, to mention here clearly. So that are, the, as I said before, the inclusive and sustainable growth in order to eradicate poverty, protect the planet and the future to young people, adoption of sustainable agricultural practices and new low carbon technologies. I know this lady before from World Vision raised the point about um, making the trade grow but that creates is environmental issues, so let's try to, to work into that direction and um, work more and, uh, around CSR, CSR, um, CSR activities. So it's a renewed commitment to CSR and create a dialogue. So we'd like to know what you gentlemen are um, expecting from the European Commission now on, and, um, and then hopefully we'll have a word from the European Commission what are they really expecting from the private sector in terms of, in terms of uh, dialogue? How are you going to work together in practice? And what is the lead up to the EU Africa Summit, notably? And then, um, and then yeah, let's try to, to just have a few, few little words on uh, what's, uh, what's the next steps. So, um, um, Mr. Stanglebert, I'll give you the floor. It works, it works. It works. Okay. Uh, just to rectify, we don't expect, we don't ask, we, we offer. As private sector, we, we offer our participation and we agree that uh, to, with Agenda for Change and the role of the private sector. When we launched three days ago the, the, the declaration, we received since now 2050 the, uh, signatures which represent a lot of people, small farmers, uh, Jetro will speak about small farmers from, from, from Caribbean, from uh, East and, and West Africa, millions. We receive a very quick reply from the small and medium companies. We have several which are part, including from the Colo ACP. And we receive support for, for a dialogue it's a, 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 with the major companies. It is, it's a really optimistic message. We are not asking, we are just offering and we are, we are telling, yes, you are in the good way. You are doing some things we can focus on and we can scale up. The social corporate responsibility is the basis of our action. Okay, thank you, Guilla. As Guy just rightly mentioned, this initiative has been launched only a few days ago and it received a, um, a very clear commitment from many players, from the private sector, from, the, from this uh, representation of over 20 million small farmers from the ACP countries. And in total, about 200 organizations already signed after three days. So for the ones who want to see the full declaration, it's on the website of ColeACP. So it's coleacp.org, I think. But I'd like to give the, the flow now to, um, to uh, Mr. Green from CAFAN. And um, what's, your, what's, your will? Uh, what's your will here? And uh, how do you want to, to engage with, uh, with this uh, initiative? Thank you very much. We have already, we are already engaged with two of, um, I would say, the EU organization, COLAP ACP, 
and CTA, and we like the concept of partnership because that is how we engage with Cola PCP. We have over 500,000 small business persons, farmers, and we, you, you notice I use the word small business persons because we are legitimately part of the private sector and we intend to ensure that the right investment, we facilitate the right investment to ensure that we who are the custodian of food security and of ensuring that the mass of the people who eat food can provide affordable food. I don't like the word cheap food. Affordable food. And ensure that we work with our partners in the EU to make sure we get the investment required. It is much cheaper and more sustainable to invest in productive activities rather than to give aid. And that is what we want. Our small farmers would strengthen in the Caribbean, the Caribbean Farmers Network, would strengthen our relationship with our existing EU partner, Cola PCP. Next week, we have a major session, training session, conducted by Cola PCP for a representative from 15 of our member countries building capacity in extension management and marketing services. So we are not talking about fury, we are talking about things that are on the ground. And we are urging the EU to look at CTA and COLAP ACP, the practical work they have been doing and the results they have been getting, and build on top of this. They don't have to go far to ensure that real partnership in development and not the kind of development that at the end of the day is a lot of paperwork, a lot of bureaucracy, and by the time you come down to it, nothing is achieved on the ground. And that is what we are seeing from our partner CTA and COLA PCP. And we urge the EU to use these as an example, and we would work with them. That was why we were so happy to sign the declaration, to work with you to ensure that we build on top of these existing, boost up the best practices that we have at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Green. I may give the, the final word to Mr. Hasselstadt, who, who you also you funded um, Grow Africa, right? Who also is a partnership that goes into that direction. So, um, so just yeah, in a few words, uh, could you please tell us um, what's, your, what's your involvement here and uh, how do you take this initiative to endorse uh, these policies? And well, as you have heard uh, uh, in my uh, presentations earlier today, <clears throat> this is for us and for the industry very important, and we are here not only representing Yara and such, we are also representing the whole agricultural industry and with the business people locally. Because yeah. if we don't do that, there are no chance that we will success. So this is as a partnership for uh, the, uh, the, the private and the private, which are the locals, and the, uh, the public. Uh, and we uh, agreements like this is also some and initiatives like this is something we are support O, and we will then drive it and drive it then as uh, one of the key members in the Grow Africa. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Sistat. And uh, sorry, I think Mr. F Mr. Philip Loop, would you be please come on come on stage? <laughs> to represent the European Commission once again. Thank you to come back. Okay, I, it looks like I'm the, the guy who replaces the others who are not around. So, uh, no, but I mean, for me, actually, it's a, it's a surprise, but it's a good surprise because uh, those who may have participated in the session we had this morning on, on our uh, future uh, communication on the role of private sector in development, one of the, the first points that we were uh, proposing is to uh, establish a platform uh, with, uh, for dialogue with private sector because uh, we realize that as a development agency we talk a lot of to civil society, we talk a lot to other donors but we do not have uh, a real dialogue with, uh, with private sector. We know that private sector people do not have a lot of time so we need to find the modalities that uh, uh, allow us to interact effectively with private sector. So. Having this as, a, as an in initiative, own initiative of private sector is really reassuring because it seems to, uh, uh, to come as a confirmation that there is appetite uh, for this kind of dialogue. So we will look uh, very closely at the uh, recommendation or, that the, on, or at the call that is made on the EU 
we will see with whether we are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, capable to deliver because, I mean, uh, we cannot certainly not uh, uh, make promises without having looked at the present, but we are certainly uh, very supportive of the initiative as such. And uh, I, I certainly congratulate you for the, uh, the big success of uh, collecting so many uh, uh, sign signatures in, in a couple of days, as I understand. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, indeed. Uh, there was a strong commitment. And I think someone from, uh, from AgroFair wants to, to give a word as well. So, um, so thank you for, for being here. Yeah, I, I um, want to salute uh, all the reactions that we have got on this uh, declaration. And I say that as a general manager of a medium-sized banana importer, AgroFair, and also as a, a member and vice chairman of uh, Colea CP. And with this declaration, we really want to underline the, the offer that many of us, small, medium, and, and larger enterprises want to make uh, we, as we realize that the businesses that we do are affecting uh, development and that, we, that within the constraints of the businesses and the trade that we do, there is also a bigger, a larger goal, uh, as we heard also uh, today, a larger goal that we need to, to leave uh, perspectives for the people that we deal with, livelihoods, perspectives especially for the young people. And that is why we have made this declaration that has been already signed in three days by so many of our fellow, uh, fellow enterprises. And we expect, we hope and expect that many more of uh, smaller, medium and larger enterprises will follow uh, this example. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and Mr. Rosalie finally arrived, so <laughs> I give you the the opportunity to, to also commend this uh, this this strong initiative, this strong sign is si sent from the from these organizations, and more to come, hopefully. Th thank you very much. Thank you to all. Uh, we we are very um, how to say uh, we commend you for this uh, initiative. It is something which is a bit unexpected for us to get so much support for something which are just in the inception phase. We are, as you know, we are just in the phase of elaborating our new policy on supporting private sector in the, in the developing countries, ACP countries. So thank you very much. This shows the way, and this is a right example of what we want to achieve. Building a coalition from the real people on the ground for an initiative that we are just about to launch. And we hope to support you and to get your support as well in the implementation phase that will be not so far away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I hope we can, uh, we can take this as the, the, strong, uh, the strong happening here uh, this year at European Development Days 2013. And uh, let's hope it's going to lead towards a uh, successful work with you guys together. Thank you everybody. Have a nice end of your day and European different days. Bye.